Good evening, everyone. My name is Regan Bowden. I'm head of global surgery and research at UCT Surgical Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the sixth global surgery webinar series in this series co-hosted by the UCT Surgical Society and the UCT Global Surgery Unit. Over the past five webinars, we have hosted speakers from various divisions in the health sphere, each speaking on topics they're actively involved in. It's been an absolute privilege to be privy to their insights and experiences into global surgery in our context, and we are absolutely sure that tonight will be no different. Uh, please feel free, as the pr speakers present, to send any questions you may have via the chat function to either myself or to Katie Pai, um, and we'll ask them during the question and answer session after both speakers have presented. If this is your first um, webinar attending in this series, we'd really recommend that you go and watch some of our previous ones on, the, on YouTube by searching UCT Surgical Society. You can also follow us on Twitter by following at UCT SurgSoc and the Global Surgery Unit by following at Global UCT. With all that being said, it's my pleasure to welcome Prof. Maswime, the Head of Global Surgery at UCT, to introduce and welcome our speakers for the evening. Thank you very much and welcome to, to all of you once again. This is always an exciting time. And today we've got two amazing, incredible speakers who are going to speak. So I'm not even going to take up a lot of your time because I'm really excited to listen to what Prof. Fegan and Dr. Reddy are going to say. Uh, I'm going to introduce Prof. Fegan, who is the head of, of surgery at UCT. He studied medicine at UCT, completing an intercalated BSc uh, medicine. Um, and after that did his internship at Grotes Gear. He then after did a MSc in neurosciences in the University of London. Uh, and they after returned to Cape Town in 1992 to specialize in neurosurgery and qualified as a fellow of the colleges, College of Neurosurgeons and also earning a doctoral degree in, in neurosurgery. He was mentored in pediatric neurosurgery by Jonathan Peter uh, worked at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital for 10 years and later developed the UCT Neurosciences Initiative, which is now the Neurosciences Institute, which he's the director of. So, and he's also the head of, of, of surgery and neurosurgery. Prof. Fegan, I'm really excited to have you here. The, I think one of the things that, that I can proudly say is that you are one of my mentors and one of the people that really inspire me and inspire all of us to do, to do the work that we do here at UCT. And then I'd like to also introduce uh, Dr. Shea Reddy. He's a physician, uh, he's, a, he's a doctor from South Africa, a Paul Farmer Fellow in the Program for Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. His research has examined design, introduction, and scale-up of health system reforms to improve surgical care globally. He's done his research in over 15 countries, has worked with the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and professional associations. And he's recently just completed his, his, his Harvard PG, PGSSC fellowship and will be coming back to Cape Town soon. So welcome, Dr. Reddy. It's, it's extremely excited and delighted to have both of you talking about finance and leadership. Those are topics that we rarely, rarely talk about. We usually, we know finances, is, we know that it's, it's happening. Someone is making decisions. Uh, someone is, is deciding how things are going to run, is organizing departments and systems, but we don't really get taught that or we hardly ever hear about how it's done. And so really excited to, to welcome both of you to talk about this. Handing over to you. Okay, so, so thank you very much, Salome, and, and, and thank you, Regan, for uh, this opportunity and, and, and also Thank you very much to UCT Surgical Society. It's, it's been incredible to see how you, you've got this uh, webinar series going um, over the, and, and, and kept it going. I think we're on to the sixth of these uh, webinars. Uh, it, it's always slightly intimidating speaking on these webinars because you know they're going to be recorded and available for posterity. So anything you say um, will, 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 be, will be documented. But anyway, I... I also want to start with a disclaimer that I, I'm always deeply skeptical of anybody who speaks about leadership because leadership is kind of one of those things that kind of just needs to get done. And, you know, 
I mean, people when they start talking about leadership, you and uh, my inclination to think that they they sort of passed it. They 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 they're no longer doing it. But uh, anyway, I'm going to have a stab at, at telling you a little bit about um, my views on, on leadership and surgery. Um, as Salome said, I have the job of, of leading a neurosurgery and the department of surgery at UCT, which has given me a couple of really great opportunities to, to, to build in, in, in new and exciting areas. Um, and, and I guess to talk about leadership in the context of global surgery is, is particularly exciting because the, the, the evolution of global surgery really kind of, to me, illustrates the way in which leadership has evolved in surgery uh, as a whole. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start off with the easy bits and then Shay's gonna uh, tell you the, the more complicated, difficult stuff about um, kind of finance and how, how we go about actually kind of really uh, putting meat on the bones of how we're gonna build healthcare systems to, to provide um, better delivery of, of, um, of surgical services. I think pretty much every talk that, that anybody gives at the moment uh, at some point reflects on, on the, the calamity of the coronavirus and how it's impacted on everything we've done this year. And I, I, I really like sort of kind of in a sense almost launching my talks on the basis of, of these uh, seven critical lessons that, that Gaston uh, wrote about in JAMA uh, three or four months ago. He's um, head of uh, the WHO uh, Center, uh, collaborating center for medical law and at Yale and reflecting on, on the impact of, of COVID on healthcare um, and underscored the importance of leadership. And I, I think it's, it's really been very clear that, that leadership has in, in some instances been one of the triumphs of how we dealt with COVID and in other ways has been one of our real failings um, in, in, in certain countries. Um, and part of, part of the, 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 the response to COVID has been to actually understand the extent to which we're all in this together. And um, healthcare in individual countries can't be in any way separated from healthcare in the rest of the, the, rest of the world. And when you're talking about healthcare around the world, obviously global health is sort of the concept that, that we're all sort of focused on at the moment. And if you ask what global health is, is it simply healthcare for other people's countries? Uh, is it international health? No, it's not. Um, and for those of you who haven't read this article, if you're interested in global surgery, I'd really, really encourage you to read this. It's published about 10 years ago by Copland and Associates that, that really tried to um, develop a common definition of what global health is. And it separates our global health from, from public health, which is really the discipline that in a sense gave birth to global health and international health, which is um, really a, a very different way of thinking about uh, delivering healthcare. Um, so why is that relevant to surgery? Well, global surgery is clearly why pretty much all of you have, have logged on to this webinar today. And when you, when you think about surgical care, I don't think I need to persuade any, any of you who are listening today that, that surgery is just an absolutely fundamental component of healthcare. And as we all know, uh, healthcare is a fundamental human right. And it's taken us a long time to really appreciate the fact that surgery and surgical conditions uh, contribute nearly a third of the global burden of disease. Um, it's not a new uh, discovery. Uh, more than 40 years ago, Myla, who was the WHO Director General at the time of the, on the ITA Declaration, uh, started pointing to the relevance of surgery. Um, Jim Kim and Paul Farmer famously referred to surgery as the neglected stepchild of global health. Um, and global surgery has sort of really developed over the last 10 or 15 years. And I, I would put it to you that the growth of global surgery has really sort of mirrored a change in the understanding of what leadership is all about in surgery. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belabor the, the sort of key findings of, of uh, Global Surgery 2030, the Lancet Commission. But what I think is, is really important to focus on is the extent to which, um, sorry, Let's get that forward. The extent to which that has really given us sort of very tangible goals that we can start working towards. But the key question I'd, I'd put to you is why did it take so long? Why, why, why has it taken decades for surgery to really sort of move to center stage in terms of global health? So, so that really sort of raises the issue of, of leadership in surgery and, and, and why the leadership of surgery maybe has been a bit slow um, out of the starting blocks in terms of making the case for surgery. And um, 
if any of you are interested broadly in the topic of leadership in surgery, I'd point you to this book. Uh, Herb Chen is the chair of, of neurosurgery at, uh, sorry, chair of surgery at the University of, of Alabama. Uh, and is actually very closely associated with UTT surgery. And Herbert Melina Kibe put together this book, a number of different authors looking at, at various issues um, around leadership and surgery. And it's available online and points to, to some of the particular issues that, that one needs to grapple with if you're leading surgical teams. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, and I'd certainly encourage anybody who's interested in the topic to, to look at the book. And I, I think to, to kind of step, step back and think about it more generally, there, there, there are clearly many, many different styles of leadership. And it's not, not my purpose today to go into talking about different styles of leadership. I think the, the two most important things I would say is for all of us, and, and pretty much all of you who are on this webinar today, if not already um, involved in leadership, you, you're going to be playing a leadership role at some point. And, and it's important to understand that it's not a case of one size fitting all. And probably even more important, uh, it's important to understand um, that you've got to be authentic. And you've got to understand your own leadership style. And, and, and you've got to understand that your own leadership is going to be tested uh, under pressure. So most of us work in, in academic health centers, academic medical centers. And, and that's, a, that's a very, very particular environment. Um, there's a rich literature on, on leadership in medicine. Um, and, and the different ways in which uh, that's evolved over the years. Um, I, I having, having been chair of a department for a number of years, I'm very partial to the, the notion of battered chairman syndrome. You can imagine what it's like coming to work every day and finding people like this sort of waiting to devour you as you, you try to go about your work of, of running academic departments. And really that points to the fact that what, what we really want, what we really need, what we, what we desire more than anything is having really smart, talented, capable people who will deliver on, on the mandates of delivering healthcare. The problem is that they, they, they're usually clever people and they can be really difficult to lead. And the, re the reason is that clever people kind of want to get on and sort of do things on their own. And, and that sort of is very closely aligned to the, the notion of, of rock stars, which is quite a common um, uh, topic of, of, of um, scholarship in, in the leadership literature, that they're the individuals who really are sort of incredibly successful and help to make organizations uh, succeed, and particularly in healthcare, um, drive a lot of the activities that are really, really difficult to lead. So, so the question is, do you, do you really, as a surgeon, do you really want to get involved in this? Because surgery, surgery is fun. It's, it's nothing, nothing more enjoyable than going to operating room and spending the day in theater, kind of doing surgery. And do you, you really want to walk away from that and get involved in, in leadership? And unfortunately, leadership often means committees, and committees are just grateful. And I, I love this um, notion that a, a committee is a group that keeps minutes and loses hours. And it often feels like you spend all day in, in committee meetings, not really making progress. But the reality is that um, if you want to make a difference, if you really want to change the system, you've kind of got to get involved in this. And surgeons have to be at the table, not just in terms of the, the hospital and the university and our professional societies, but also at regulatory bodies, government level. And, and I think that's where the sweet spot of global surgery has been, has been actually starting to, to find ways that surgeons can actually engage with these um, important government structures, and Shea is going to illustrate to you just now uh, the ways in which kind of money gets distributed that really sort of underpins um, where, where healthcare gets delivered. So, so as I said just now, for me, global surgery kind of reflects the way in which uh, leadership has changed in, in surgery. And if you look at sort of uh, surgery in years gone by, a, a lot of the surgical leadership is focused on Kind of how, how are you going to deliver on that mandate in the operating room and the, the kinds of personalities that are required in order to to kind of drive home that kind of surgical mission uh, in the hospital and and that sort of really evolved today into a very different um, set of, of priorities obviously delivering on that that surgical mandate is still important and and i think if you look at the essential qualities of surgical leaders today it's still completely non-negotiable. You can't, you can't lead a surgical discipline unless you are a surgeon and, and have that capacity to kind of understand what surgery is about and understand the ways in which surgeons make decisions 
uh, be able to teach and impart uh, surgical skills, understand the professionalism and the kind of attitudes that drive surgeons. Um, but things like emotional competence, communication skills, and business acumen, uh, as you're going to hear about just now from Shay. And, and most of all, teamwork, the understanding that surgeons are not solo operators, that actually we have to function most effectively in teams. And you look at all these different attributes, well, it's kind of impossible for anyone on the planet to kind of pull all this together. And it's sort of a bit reminiscent to what Abraham Lincoln said some years ago. So, so this is all really laudable to, to talk about stuff like this, but can you teach it? I mean, are, you, are, are, are leaders not, not born uh, rather than made? And, and actually, I think the reality is you can teach a lot of this stuff. And, and increasingly, surgical programs are paying attention to this. Um, so uh, there's a, a program that I'm particularly impressed with in Michigan, that, uh, at the University of Michigan, that puts a lot of attention on, on teaching leadership. And, and they've devised something that they call the Michigan Promise, uh, which is something I think we need to pay a bit more attention to here at UCT, in terms of what's, what it is when, when registrars start um, in the program at the University of Michigan. Um, there, there are a bunch of expectations that they're told the, the program's going to deliver on, a lot of which does relate to uh, all these meta skills that they're going to gain beyond the operating room. And a lot of it relates to um, an absolute expectation that they're going to be in an inclusive environment that is going to celebrate diversity, which is something that's clearly critically important for us in South Africa. That it's not just about surgical excellence, but it's about kind of teaching people how to deliver on, on leadership and build healthcare systems beyond the operating room. A lot of this is dependent on having the academic skills and um, Salome, who, who very kindly introduced me there, is, 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 is chair of the South African Clinician Scientist Society. And, and this, is, this, is, this is obviously a, a, a concept that I think is, is very close to the hearts of many of you that are, that are listening to this webinar. The sort of the idea that you, you want to go uh, ahead and, and kind of have successful clinical careers, but clinical careers where you go contribute to science. And, and the reality is that there are, there are lots of opportunities to kind of build your career in that way. It's, it's not such a, 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 a kind of a, an unusual path to choose anymore. The obvious reason why you want to do that is that it's, it's going to enable you to offer better treatment for your patients. Um, you know, if, you, if you're able to contribute to knowledge, and you're able to identify research questions and answer them, you're going to do a better job as a clinician, um, especially as a surgeon. Um, in, in South Africa, we don't have that many structured search and scientist programs, but I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of examples at the end of my talk that will hopefully under, 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 underline the fact that it's still possible to do this in South Africa at this point, even if we're still in the early stages of developing these programs. Um, one of the sort of landmark programs in the world is the Toronto program that's been going for close to 40 years. And one of the, the, the key things about their program is, is taking registrars and actually giving them dedicated time where they can spend two or three years in the lab or in a, in a research environment doing full-time research, um, applying for external funding. That's probably the single most important thing that you need to learn if you want to really build a kind of independent scientific career, that you've got to go out there and raise money. Um, universities are not ATMs. They don't just give you money for research, however much. It kind of seems that they should. You've got, to, you've got to use university to go out there and raise money and then ultimately learn the skills that will enable you to become an independent scholar, an independent researcher. Um, and if any of you are interested, this was recently written up a couple of weeks ago, a sort of review of the last 40 years of the Toronto program and uh, the number of surgeons that have gone through that program and have gone on to develop uh, surgical skills and research skills through that program. So, so if you've got a vision, and, and leadership is very much about vision, <clears throat> it needs you to make a plan. And, you know, just to use the example of global surgery, um, when, when I took over as, as HOD of surgery at UCT, it was clear to me we had a department we had many, many divisions, but we didn't really have a common plan uh, for how we wanted to function as a department. And one of the things that really distressed me was we didn't really have a presence in global surgery. And I, I saw this as a huge opportunity, and I, I saw our place in, in Africa as giving us a unique opportunity to really sort of have an impact in global surgery. Uh, not just the fact that we were 
teaching and training people in an African context, but we had opportunities to, to do relevant work um, through research and innovation that was going to enable better healthcare. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's really about people. And, and I just want to end off with what I think are two very inspiring uh, examples of that. So when we set up to, to establish global surgery, um, it was an enormous uh, privilege to, to have Salome kind of step into the position of being prepared to lead global surgery at UCT. Um, and you know, under, under Salome's leadership, we've developed a vision and a mission for how we're going to do this and to, to pull together this, this incredible consortium uh, of people in different, different disciplines. And I promise you, you know, a decade ago, um, this would have been almost inconceivable in surgery that, that um, the, the head of surgery would be paying attention to building links with a bunch of different departments and, and not just focusing on the single core operative mission of surgery. And, and this for me is the, the real magic of global surgery that um, it's enabling people like Salome to step forward and play a leadership role and start to really sort of start to change the way in which we're delivering healthcare uh, in a very, very impactful sort of way. And if, if any of you want to read more about Salome, you can, you can, if you haven't already read this profile in the Lancet, I'd really encourage you to have a look at that. Um, and another, another person who um, I, I think is, is a really inspirational role model for, for, for all of you out there who are South African clinicians who, who are looking to develop uh, careers as clinician or, or even better surgeon scientists is Tony Figaji, who's, who's another one of my colleagues in, in neurosurgery. So Tony trained with us at UCT, um, did his neurosurgical uh, training, which I guess, I mean, that's the the, the, the basis of being a specialist. Uh, Tony stuck around with us at Red Cross as a fellow in pediatric neurosurgery. But what really set him apart was, was, was doing a PhD. Tony was, in fact, the first neurosurgeon uh, in our department to do a PhD. And that, that really set him up for an incredibly successful career as a surgeon scientist. Um, had, a, had wonderful accolades, leadership positions in a number of societies, and, and probably the, the single biggest achievement of all um, being awarded a research chair uh, in clinical neuroscience. Uh, one of only three full-time clinicians out of 200 research chairs in the country. Tony's one of only three who's a clinician and he's the only, the only surgeon in South Africa to have an a, a NRA-funded research chair. So what I'm trying to illustrate is it's possible. If you've got, a, if you've got the design, you, you have the correct mentorship and you, you really kind of set your heart on it and you you're kind of prepared to put in the hard yards. A career as a surgeon scientist in South Africa is eminently attainable. And just to end off with um, one of my real sort of role models as, a, as an HOD of surgery is Jim Rutka, who's the head of surgery in Toronto. Uh, Jim's also a pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, and uh, I've, I've really sort of set my, set my course by, by this philosophy of his that, that really if you, want to, if you want to go out there as a leader and build a legacy, it's not about how thick your CV is and how many hundred publications you've got and how many buildings you've put up and how many research grants you've got. It's about the people that you've developed and, and how they've gone on to kind of change the organization and change healthcare. And, and that's really kind of what, what our job is about. And that's a, the real privilege of, of leadership in healthcare and, and surgery in particular. So kind of that's, yeah, that's how, how I've gone about trying to do things and, and hopefully that kind of sets the stage for, for Shay to tell you about um, how you can implement that vision uh, in, in, in real terms through kind of finding the money to, to make it all happen. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof Vegan, for that really um, informative and then also inspiring presentation. Really, really grateful for that. Um, I'm really looking forward to what uh, Dr. Reddy can bring to the table now as well. So we're trying to link these two things together. I've really got a lot of questions um, coming through that I'm really excited for us to dig into afterwards. Um, so thank you. Dr. Reddy, you can share your screen and get going when you're ready. You are just muted, Dr. Reddy, sorry. That there always go. happens. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it gets edited out. Um, well, thanks, uh, Regan and team, uh, for inviting me. 
Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge privilege to to speak uh, with all of you, um, and congrats on on really putting together what's turned out to be you know an, an incredible webinar uh, and a resource uh, for for many people in this movement uh, of what we call global uh, surgery. Uh, Salome, thank you so much for the the, the warm introduction. Um, and you know, just to follow up on what Professor Fegan said, you know, there's no doubt that that leadership is key. And for all the the junior, um, you know, emerging um, physicians, med students, probably it's very hard to teach leadership. But by emulating many of the the qualities uh, imbued by you know Professor Maswime, uh, Professor Fegan, and Figaji you can figure out what works for you, given your goals, given your position, uh, and, and assume some, develop the leadership qualities you require. Uh, that being said, leadership and financing are two key inputs of any health system and critical if we're going to uh, improve surgical healthcare. So let me get going before uh, Regan uh, warns me about the time. Um, in terms of disclosures, I have none, but the, I will approach financing from a middle income country perspective and context. I think the political and economic dynamics within this group of countries is comparable more so than between the high income and lower income country groups. So I'll focus on this, uh, group. Um, and I want to discuss, uh, three three aspects in relation to financing. The first is to provide some context on the trends happening at, at a global level in terms of health system financing uh, and where surgical financing may fit into that. The second is to outline the components of a, a strategy that we might use um, in the global south, so to speak, um, to finance surgical healthcare services. And then finally, uh, touch on the link between creating value um, by harnessing aspects of the, of the financing process. So um, most of you will know all of this, so, so please um, forgive me for, for stating uh, what you already know, but it's of no surprise that, that you know, there are rising healthcare costs. Uh, most countries spend a lot more uh, as a proportion of their economic output on healthcare. And this is true across income country groups, if we're going to use that classification, but also in different regions uh, of the world. This is also true of the emerging economies. Here, I've included a sample of the BRICS nations, Next 11 and Mint country groups. And if we look at per capita spending on health, uh, most have increased, some have increased threefold, uh, some twofold. Um, and this seems to be a trend which will continue uh, mostly as countries transition to aging societies, more non communicable diseases and injury, of which surgical care is a key uh, you know, intervention required. Um, and so really there's a need to prepare for these, these shifts happening. But in addition to the kind of general trend happening uh, at an aggregate level, it's important to look at the source of funding. And as country income groups um, you know, move in terms of their income per capita, there's some economic development, uh, so to speak, so too are there changes in, in where the funding is coming from. So low income country groups are very dependent on developmental assistance. And with that comes, of course, terms and, con and conditions of what countries might prioritize for their health system. Um, and there's also a lot of out of pocket uh, payments. Then in the lower middle income group, as countries are, are less qualified for developmental assistance, there's now this dependence 
on out-of-pocket expenditures, which are, of course, unpredictable uh, and result in high levels of catastrophic health expenses and pushing people further into, into poverty as a result of unpredictable healthcare conditions. In the upper middle income group of which South Africa is part of, you know, public financing, there's a shift towards public resources, but there's still a significant uh, out-of-pocket expense and some prepaid private insurance. And as we move to the high income groups, there's a dominance of public financing as the, mo as the dominant mode of funding. Um, and to some extent, there's some private, you know, voluntary insurance that people can use to top up on and out-of-pocket expenses is at a minimum. Uh, so people, insofar as their health are concerned, they are largely protected uh, from unpredictable expenses relating to their health. Um, and of course, that is only a good thing. So there is a transition, clearly, as countries develop economically, as uh, income, you know, and household income increases uh, per capita, you have this shift from private sources of health system financing, largely out of pocket um, or private expenses to publicly funded systems of which health insurance might be one way, but also general tax revenues, which is what South Africa uses to a large extent. And the benefit, of course, is that, you know, insurance allows you to pool resources together and to cross subsidize risk in terms of income, in terms of uh, region, in terms of race and base. And, and that has a fairness uh, component. You know, when you pull risk together, you enhance equity and there's greater solidarity, uh, which is a key objective of any health system. In terms of surgical care though, we are on the regressive end. and and so, you know, this is a major issue. So financing is not really, um, you know, uh, something to think about after developing a plan or after mobilizing stakeholders together. It's really something to think about from the beginning. Uh, and and it's, we have a tremendous opportunity now to really act and explore options uh, for financing the expansion of, of surgical healthcare services. So let's let's get into into that. Oh, one more, one more graph here, just to say that you know funding is not the only thing, and this graph uh, tries to um, depict that. Uh, on the x-axis, we have um, health expenditure per capita, and on the y-axis, under five mortality and what you can see is that for countries that spend a similar amount uh, on health, they achieve very different health outcomes in terms of under five mortality. Um, if you look at, you know, Vietnam, India, Pakistan, Nigeria. And so really there's other factors here at play in terms of how the health system is designed, its governance and organization, uh, the extent to which managers are displaying leadership and making rational choices based on a changing environment and context. COVID is a, is a great example. Uh, and how they're able to respond to um, changes in, in the environment in a dynamic and, and agile fashion. Um, you know, these are key variables which need to be explained. So financing is important, but it's also not the most important aspect as well. Um, so, Strategy, you know, I do think that that a, a systematic approach could be followed in the middle income country uh, group of nations. Um, there's a lot going on in these countries in terms of developing surgical plans, in terms of uh, aligning surgical health priorities with that of a broader country approaches to implement UHC. Uh, there are also movements to um, capacitate district facilities as a model that could be then scaled up. Whatever the country chooses, there has to be a strategy. 
uh, which which I which I think um, has been has been lacking at least a, a deliberate strategy to finance surgical healthcare, uh, which should allow uh, you know countries to achieve five goals. The first is um, to justify and clearly outline the reasons for why a Ministry of Health and Finance should actually allocate additional funding in a sustainable fashion for surgical healthcare services. The second is around feasibility. You know, many countries have developed, you know, NSOPs, um, but it's really worth figuring out what the, what, the, uh, what the cost will be and what is the range of investment that might be feasible for a country. Uh, it's, it's arguably of little value developing uh, plans if at the end of the day, uh, it's simply the, the fiscal space is so constrained that the plan will not be funded. So that has to be looked at. The third aspect is around political strategy. Um, and it's important to map out the players involved that influence health system funding decisions, and then to frame the proposed policy in a way that aligns with the interests of these funders, which change over time. The fourth goal is, is to promote efficiency. Uh, the, it's, it's, I do think it's quite important to uh, streamline and align uh, the financing of the surgical reform with the broader uh, government's budgeting process, um, as well as other opportunities and threats uh, insofar as it affects uh, funding decisions at the, health, uh, at the kind of ministerial level. And then finally, accountability. Um, it's, you know, accountability in terms of transparency is important to uh, monitor and track funding flows to healthcare programs and evaluate to what extent desired outcomes are achieved. Um, so how do we do a strategy? What are the components? The first step is to develop an investment case. And um, many of you in public health will know that often investment cases are formulated to provide the reasons uh, to Treasury or the Department of Finance outlining uh, why uh, additional allocations uh, for a particular cause are necessary. And there are three components to this in general. The first is to outline uh, the cost of the proposed intervention as well as the timeline uh, of implementation. Uh, and this will also require some sense of, you know, what, what additional services is the proposed policy uh, suggesting? How do we cost this uh, in relation to what is feasible uh, over the medium to long term? Uh, second is to uh, examine the changes in terms of how the health system will be governed and organized, how there will be changes in terms of resource mobilization, um, and how that will translate into changes in service delivery in terms of the provision of surgical healthcare services. And then finally, to comment on, uh, based on different projected scenarios, uh, the anticipated improvement in health system performance, population level health, and also importantly, what will happen to the other developmental priorities of the state uh, within the kind of broader developmental discourse uh, of the government. So this, this diagram, I don't want you to focus on, 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 on everything here, but essentially just the uh, red box. In order to cost the, the, the proposed intervention, two decisions need to be made. The first is, what services will be provided? What, what surgical healthcare services? And the second is, who will receive these? What population, so what segments of the population will receive these healthcare services? And, um, you know, there seems to be two approaches that countries could adopt. 
The first is to uh, provide a limited range of services uh, to, the, to a large uh, population, to many segments of the population. And the second approach might be to include a more comprehensive set of surgical healthcare services to just a few. Um, few countries can do both at the same time, uh, mostly because the fiscal space is so constrained, funding is inadequate to do both. And also in a way that ensures that the quality is maintained. Expanding access to surgical healthcare services uh, with, without ensuring that there's adequate quality can also produce poor outcomes at the end of the day. Um, these decisions are both technical but also political uh, and uh, has a lot to do with the values, prevailing values around healthcare and the discourse around health uh, within the government. So for instance, if equity is a key concern as it is for many governments, uh, then addressing the disparities in surgical healthcare will be of principal importance. So they may adopt the approach where you, where for instance, they might fund just the bellwether procedures, the most essential surgical healthcare services uh, for those that are most deprived. Those, those people and citizens in the poorest provinces, in rural areas, and in the lowest income quintiles. That would help to address uh, those disparities. But so it has to be related uh, in thinking through what are the values of the state and at the population at large uh, as a means of framing and thinking about what is the appropriate package of surgical services to provide. And based on that, one is able to cost that package that's appropriate given these considerations. So the step two uh, involves determining um, you know, where the funding might come from uh, and commenting on the range of investment that might be feasible uh, and the probability of securing that investment. And so here one might employ the uh, fiscal space approach. Fiscal space, uh, for those of you that are not familiar, basically refers to the potential availability of additional uh, public funding uh, to allocate to the healthcare sector without compromising other aspects of development or long-term solvency of the, of the state. Uh, and there's typically five sources, and we added a fifth pillar uh, of, that relates to innovative financing. So the first is the macroeconomic conditions, and this has something to do with you know, economic output, uh, government revenue, but also household and sovereign debt. Uh, clearly, if a country is growing steadily, uh, there's a larger portion of the general fiscus can be allocated to the health sector. But also, if the country is under, you know, uh, significant debt that it's owing, um, and also there's household debt, uh, countries cannot tax citizens more and also government has to pay more uh, to, to, to kind of sustain its debt payments. Uh, the second has to do with allocation to the healthcare sector uh, as part of the national, as part of the annual health budget. Uh, the third involves the, 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 the implementation of specific taxes uh, that may be allocated to specific healthcare programs. So for instance, one might use a sugar tax and allocate a portion of that uh, for a screening policy for diabetes. And they are specific uh, tax, you know, um, uh, kind of configurations that one might explore for financing surgical services. Um, the fourth has to do with the efficiency of using healthcare, uh, of using uh, existing allocations uh, to the healthcare sector. One may look at the funding flows in, along the national health accounts to map out uh, wasteful expenditure and look at technical and allocated efficiency. 
And then the final, which doesn't really uh, uh, apply very well to middle-income countries, is external sources from bilateral and multilateral entities. And then innovative financing is a, a currently unexplored, untapped uh, source, uh, which has been leveraged in the global health community to uh, add funding to uh, neglected areas like HIV, AIDS, vaccinations, and, and, and other aspects. Uh, and, and we could look at that potentially for surgical care as well. The, the final step is to map out the players involved in making resource allocation decisions within a country and to determine the level of support that they might have for, a, for the proposed surgical policy. Uh, in addition to determining uh, their dependability over the long term in supporting you and this policy. Um, and then to kind of look at their interests, you know, what, what are their interests now and over the long term, and to adapt and kind of frame the policy in a way that aligns with their preferences so that one could reach shared goals and shared objectives. Um, and, and this is a key priority, I think, in the South African context, where the private sector provides significant um, volume of healthcare services. And it's a question of figuring out what is the sweet spot of alignment. So to bring all the pieces together of a strategy consists of three steps. Um, and here I'm focusing on the, on the left box uh, specifically. The first is to develop an investment case, which helps to justify reasons for a surgical health policy. The second is to figure out where funding will come from and to comment on the probability of raising a specific funding range from specific sources. And then finally, uh, is step three involves a political strategy to frame the policy in a way that aligns with the dominant actors in the system. Um, and, you know, one may use the ENSO process if a country is developing an ENSO, they may not wish to do so, but if they are, then that process can really be used to fulfill some of these objectives. So what is the role of, of value? You know, I think value-based healthcare has been around for some time, um, and we tend to think of it in terms of the provision of the actual healthcare service. Um, but value can, can also be unlocked along the value chain, or uh, in terms of how health systems uh, mobilize resources for funding uh, healthcare services. So uh, this is a diagram we developed for innovative financing, but I want you to concentrate on the red arrows, which relate to um, uh, kind of sub-functions of health systems. Every health system has to mobilize funding, bring them together, channel and allocate them to specific funding, to specific health areas, uh, which are actually implemented uh, through, through service delivery. Uh, and which lead to goals of the of the healthcare system, and each along each of those components, value can be unlocked. So, in terms of mobilization, in addition from looking at the traditional sources of public funding, which I explained before in fiscal space analysis, innovative instruments can also be used. And an example there might be how the Global Fund was able to use. Uh, you know, my combination of micro levies, bonds, which allow sustainable funding. Gavi also uses that, uh, but also, uh, you know, contributions from the retail sector. If you look at product red, when you buy, if you buy an iPhone as product red, a portion of that goes to uh, the global fund, which is then pooled, which allows for some cross subsidization of risk. Um, and then channeling through a single entity um, in a more streamlined fashion that's accountable to a broad set of stakeholders from different representative groups 
It might be a third party separate from government uh, so that it's transparent and accountable with a board um, and so forth. And then allocated directly to providers, which might be in the private or public sectors, and allocated in a way uh, in which the payment mechanisms on the implementation are altered so that the behaviors of those involved in, pro in providing the actual care enhances performance. And there are many ways of paying providers from you know, performance based mechanisms to uh, disease related groups and so forth. And there's a lot of space to really be imaginative here and to explore new ways of adding value. At each step, it's worthwhile thinking about how will, you know, objectives of the surgical system be enhanced in terms of population level health, financial risk protection, and making citizens happy about the services that they receive figuring out really what is it that, that people expect from their physicians, from healthcare institutions is really quite critical. And having that evaluation process uh, inform uh, decisions at every stage in a dynamic, constantly evolving way. Um, oh, that was the box. I, I should have put that uh, sooner. Um, so, uh, in summary, um, before we get to the discussion, I want to emphasize three points. The first is that when thinking about financing, uh, it's important to contextualize within the broader trends of health system financing. Now, COVID has affected a lot. Many countries are borrowing funding. That's going to constrain the fiscal space significantly. And so when thinking about surgical healthcare packages or expanding surgical healthcare that sensitivity should, um, should be born. Um, and one has to relate these broader trends with the, the kind of domestic dynamics at a country level. Uh, second is that a systematic approach can be followed to mobilize sustainable funding for surgical healthcare. And then finally, we might employ innovative approaches, approaches to the funding process to unlock value, which hopefully will make patients more satisfied with the services we provide them with. So that's, that's all I have, Regan. Uh, Amazing, thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. That was a, a truly excellent and thorough presentation. Um, Prof. Seema was definitely correct when she said that this type of thinking isn't taught often. Um, especially to younger professionals and students. So really grateful for that presentation. Uh, I have a few questions uh, that will go out to uh, all of you. Um, I think the first one is for Prof. Fegan, and then uh, each of you as well can answer. Um, but the question was, what can we do right now um, as young professionals or as young doctors or students to develop our leadership? Prof, you spoke quite a bit about registrarship and fellowship training. Um, are there immediate short-term steps we can take now to grow in this area? <laughs> so that's, that's a question. So thanks, Regan. So the first thing is just get involved um, for, for undergraduate students. Get involved in student structures. Um, what, one, one, of, one of the, the most gratifying aspects of my, my current position is, is just seeing how many students are kind of learning the most amazing things through the surgical society. And, um, you know, I've, I've been around long enough to realize not all of you are going to end up becoming surgeons. Um, some of you sort of fall off, you know, go, go, go astray and end up doing medicine and all sorts of other things. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you know, the surgical student society is the most amazing vehicle for uh, learning um, leadership skills. Shawco is another one. Shawco has been around for decades. And, you know, many, many uh, generations of, of, of uh, health science students. So it's not, obviously not just about medical students, so students in the faculty. And there, there are other ways for the students to get involved. And, and so there, there are many, many opportunities. And, and it, it, it may, um, there may not be an obvious link between getting involved in those structures now and sort of where, where you're gonna um, function later in, in your careers. But there's, there's, a very, there's a very strong link. And I, I would 
deeply encourage all, all undergraduate students to get involved. And then as, as you know, interns, community service doctors, there are lots of different structures to get involved in. And I, I think leadership is about just seeing, seeing the need to do things and, and getting involved. And uh, it's as simple as that. Shane, Thank you, Prof. to that? Uh, Dr. Eddie, you're sorry you, again. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I agree with with all of that, and and you know South Africa as a you know and and the continent has a long tradition of uh, creating uh, you know exceptional uh, leadership leadership, um, and I guess the role of of institutions of of academics uh, and and you know you know as we train leaders is to create an enabling environment that allow young people to flourish and do what they do best based on their own terms, you know? Um, and, and, and it's a, that adaptability, responsiveness to um, young people's needs that I think will create leadership. And the second element is by providing role models. At UCT, there's enough role models, just looking at Professor Maswime and Graham Fegan. You know, I mean, you, you just have to, you know, observe these figures and see you know what what do you think works based on how i'm seeing the world and then to to form your own hybrid approach to leadership um it's hard to adopt leadership qualities when it's taught to you directly it's an indirect process in many ways um but our challenges in the country um really push people in the way of leadership uh, because we have so many challenges to 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 grapple with Prof. Mastrimi, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, I do. And I think what one, one thing that stood out for me that Graham said, uh, investing in, in, in students, in, in their creativity, in their innovation and potential, and that we have a responsibility to do that. When I was in medical school, it was known students must be seen but not heard. And we have long moved past that era. You know, today, you guys are leading. You guys are leading this. You're leading these webinars. You're leading a lot of, in, we, we're just partnering with you, you know, and that's, that's a great sign that we've moved past the era where we wanted students to be in the background. You guys should lead and we will push you and support you. But it's definitely the whole leadership model has changed now, allowing everybody to participate and, and show, develop and show a sense of leadership. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, the next question sort of brings the two talks together. And I mean, it starts off by saying that obviously the case, the investment case for surgery is strong. I mean, that's why we're all here. But what are some of the helpful and proven strategies to convince funders of this case? Each of you has had different experiences in the fundraising or the funding sector. Um, besides developing the investment case, how can we raise funds? How can we draw inspiration from examples from your experiences? So Shay, do you want to have a crack at that and then I'll follow you? Sure. Uh, Regan, if you find the answer to that, let me know. That, that is the, the key question. Um, and, you know, we, we haven't found a sustainable uh, funding approach for surgical healthcare. Um, and often, you know, the arguments that we've used so far has helped to galvanize uh, people interested in surgery within the medical profession and public health profession, but it hasn't really made inroads into the key funders uh, that will that we require to fund surgical expansion policies over a medium to long term, right? Um, the the second issue is that you know sustainable funding you know often comes or stems from um, the pressure exerted from civil society, right? So. We, you know, if you look at the South African context, the role that the TAC played uh, using, you know, really struggle discourse, struggle tactics to force the government uh, into action is undeniable. Now, in global surgery, that element is lacking, and so we have to be very sophisticated in, in, in because really we're working from within, right? 
we're working from within a silo, we also then have to persuade governments who have so many issues to deal with. And often surgical healthcare doesn't fit that neatly with what they, with their priorities and with the level of funding available. They also need easy approaches to implementation. We have to make work as easy as possible so that the resistance is low. Um, and so it's about rethinking these arguments, providing a systematic approach to funding, given their constraints, and working with civil society to put that pressure on government so that it doesn't forget about this huge need. Yeah, so maybe just to, to, to add to that, um, I mean, certainly, I mean, they're, 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 I would say they're, they're the rational and logical arguments and then the, the um, I guess, the strategic arguments. I mean, the rational argument would be that and so many surgical interventions are just truly cost effective. You know, when I was on call on the weekend, we had a four year old kid came in with an extra dural that was operated on, and on the ward on the next morning, I had a discussion with my registrars about the cost effectiveness of that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I struggle to think of a single intervention in medicine that is as cost effective as doing a craniotomy for an extra dural hematoma. You know, in terms of disability-adjusted life years saved, it, it, it's it's just absolutely mind-blowing. So, so on a logical level, surgery has an awful lot to offer. But I, I, I Shay, just to pick up on your your very innovative financing um, models and strategies that you presented, maybe to to kind of maybe reflect a question back to you in terms of the incentives to do this and. And um, you, you know, you spoke about civil society, but I wonder if there isn't maybe a, a kind of a different perspective that COVID has brought about in the sense that, I mean, clearly COVID has caused devastation in many ways in terms of healthcare, but it, it's maybe also underlines to countries the need to be self-sufficient to some extent in terms of healthcare that is available. And, and particularly when it comes to the elites that make the decisions and often squander the resources in countries, I don't know enough about the economics of it, but I would imagine that most African countries can deliver adequate health care for their populations without being dependent on the World Bank and the IMF and the Gates uh, Foundation and that sort of thing. There are sufficient resources. It's just not the incentive. And, and if, the, if the elites, uh, so, and I'll, get, I'll give you a specific example. So there's a fantastic webinar I watched last, last week on cardiac surgery. Um, that Dominique was actually part of. And, and there was a statement made um, that there, something like six billion, I don't know how this got worked out, but it's a compelling statement. Something like six billion dollars a year is spent by Africans seeking healthcare outside of Africa. That's an awful lot of money. Um, another uh, figure given 100,000 East Africans seek treatment in India every year. I and mean, there's no shortage of really good doctors in East Africa. Um, so, so if one could somehow kind of turn, that, turn those resources inwards and, and you know, the, the individuals who can seek treatments outside of their countries, if the resources are focused on, on actually building just satisfactory and sustainable healthcare systems in individual countries, then maybe, maybe in a way that COVID has underscored that, suddenly you can't travel abroad. You need to um, access treatment in your own country. Maybe that will change the, the discourse and, and make the people who, who otherwise squander the money that should be should be spent on healthcare in countries realize that actually they've got to they've got to actually spend that money on making healthcare sustainable in their own countries. I mean, is that a is that a reasonable perspective? Well, I I agree fully. You know, I mean, we have to you know turn the mirror on on ourselves, and you know, and and that's why I put you know that slide on on funding sources for low income countries, you know, and, and just to show how dependent many are on, on external actors, you know, and that really does shape what the, those countries fund. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and we have to reduce that, that dependence. Um, the, the, the second issue is that, you know, I, th there's, we should come together and really brainstorm and examine the potential possibilities. Because I think when we think through the dynamics in South Africa, in, in Africa, 
we could configure many novel ways of mobilizing funding in-house um, and allocating it to very uh, in, in creative ways of delivering care uh, at our providers in ways that really make patients happy. Uh, you know, care must also be changed. It must be more targeted. It must be integrated with other healthcare needs. You know, hospitals are not designed for care, the care of the patient. When you go into the hospital, you think as if, oh, you know, you, know, you don't feel good. Uh, it should get, give, you know, and provide people with a sense of healing. You know, we lack all of that. So there's lots of opportunity. They also unsustainable and not, you know, draining resources on the environment. So there's a lot of potential to unlock and reimagine. And, and I think, you know, the continent is well positioned to, to doing so. Um, and the final argument, you know, around uh, wasteful expenditure within the government, I mean, that is a huge issue. I mean, if you look at, you know, you know leadership forums that, that at the World Economic Forum or Africa Union, you know, African leaders are always speaking about this. Paul Kagame speaks about the role of leadership. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we, we should work a lot more with our colleagues, you know, at the business school who look at leadership and managerial capabilities, but also in political science and government who look at the nature of the state and power to figure out, you know, how we can really transform our decision makers into, you know, providing those role models that make decisions based on the needs of people. I mean, Leaders should be ennobled by power, not, uh, you know, making decisions that uh, result in squandering those limited resources. So uh, I fully agree. And there's lots of uh, potential for us to explore. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, really good discussion. And then comes back to something that Prof. Steve Reed said in one of our previous webinars, where he, he like really hopped on the importance of generalists in providing surgery in South Africa uh, at really cost-effective decentralized ways that can really improve the health care of a population with you know least amounts of resources needed and I think like the last question is going to be I want really quick answers from all three of you I know it's going to be tough but the question is uh, you have all profits we may included studied quite intensely and quite broadly and studied internationally at international institutes is this sort of studying and work necessary to lead in our context? Um, would you recommend that to other students or young professionals? Yes. <laughs> is that a yes? Is that a resounding yes from all three of you? <laughs> I, th I think you need, you, you know, I mean, Everything I'm doing now is because of my South African experience, you know, but going overseas showed me a different perspective altogether, as well as traveling to other African countries and, and to places where I would sit and think if, if I was to have me to get to the nearest hospital. So it's, it's, it's not just saying go, go to America travel and see how the rest of the world is doing things and that opens your perspective yeah i i, I agree fully um uh, professor fegan had a resounding yes so i'm not going to take the opposite position but you know one thing i remember from high school my history teacher said uh if you forget everything just travel you know and there's some truth to that because you learn about, you get a different perspective, you know, as, as Lome says. And, but for me personally, it's always been inspired by what I observed in the South African context. You know, uh, it, there's, there's a richness in what medical students and, and, and trainees uh, witness in our public health system uh, and, and relating that to our history, you know. But then you develop a comparative sensibility when looking at other contexts. And then you come back and then you adopt a, you know, a novel, a novel approach. So maybe to, I'll, I'll end off with just a quick anecdote. So when, when I did my elective um, at the end of first year, I went to, to UCLA to do neurosurgery. And at the end of my time, the, the, the chair of neurosurgery, Don Baker, said to me, 
the single most important thing you'll ever learn when you travel abroad is, is how good things are at home. <laughs> and I think it's true. And it, it kind of reflects both what Salome and Shea both said. So, yeah, that kind of, that is the perspective. Thank you so much to all of you for a really rich discussion. I really wish we had more time. Um, I've got some really long and complicated questions in my inbox um, <laughs> that would have taken much longer to discuss. Um, but so thank you so much for our, our discussion there. I'm just going to hand over to Prof. Nusreen here to sort of give a conclusion and then do some announcements. All right. Thank you again. Uh, and this is, I'm going to ask all of you to bear with me for just another five minutes because we've got some really important announcements. But I think from tonight's message, you know, just if I could put it in one sentence, putting everything together, I think what Prof. Vegan said that surgeons have to be on the table, you know, for me that that stood out, that, that that's powerful and that that's what that's where we need to be it's not just not only on the cutting table but on the decision making table and you know we we might have to split ourselves in half <laughs> to 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 do both but we definitely have to be there uh, but what Cher brought to that was that you know you you go there with a strategy it's not just about being there you need a strategy you need a plan you need to understand what you're talking about you need to have a budget you know you need to understand all of this so so we need to equip ourselves and, and and prepare ourselves to be to be on that table so thank you both for 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 excellent uh talks so i've got some important announcements and and my my first important announcement is just to uh before we get to that one uh regan um i i want to to congratulate Regan and, and KT Pai for being chosen as the vice president and, and president of the Surgical Student Society. It's been amazing working with you guys. And I especially want to thank Savannah, who's been an amazing leader. And the past year, I've really, really enjoyed working with you, Savannah, and, and seeing your amazing leadership and congratulating the, the two of you with Katie as president and, and, and Regan as vice president and wishing you the best for, for the year ahead. Uh, and my, my next important announcement is that in the next, uh, next week on the 10th of, of October, we'll be having our, fir our conference, uh, first global surgery conference but I think it's the seventh or so uh, South, Southern African Student Surgical Society Conference, and we've combined, the, combined it this year. The theme is Reimagining Perioperative Care in Africa, and uh, we've got a very exciting lineup of speakers, including uh, the two speakers, Graham and Shea, that have just spoken. We've got amazing speakers, Prof. Koto from, from Medunsa, Prof. Chiflaro, from UP, Prof. Smith from 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 Vets, uh, Prof. Chu from Stellenbosch. So it's really going to be an amazing uh, conference. You can register online for 100 rands uh, per person. And our biggest highlight is that uh, the WHO will also be supporting this event, and the Director General, Dr. Tedros, will be giving an an, an address at this in, at this event. So we'd like you all to publicize this, and we'd really like to have a really full house of of, of people attending this event. And lastly, just before I hand over to Alana, I also just wanted to acknowledge, I saw that we've got Dr. Ruben Ayala in, in the house, who is the vice president of the G4 Alliance, which is, uh, which is really the, the council, the global council for, for, global, for, for global surgery. And it's really great that he's been able to, to join us today. Uh, handing over to Alana for the next message, for the next announcement, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Good evening, everyone. I'd um, just like to take a few moments to take this opportunity to mention our upcoming um, outreach initiative, which is the Scrub Run taking place on the 18th of October. We will be running in our medical scrubs, five kilometers or 10 kilometer races as part of the Sunlum Cape Town Virtual Marathon. And each runner is aiming to raise funds for each kilometer that they run. And 100% of the proceeds will be going towards emergency care 
and the emergency centre at the incredible Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. We're really excited and really passionate about this event and it's open to anyone, doctors, students, family, friends, anyone can get involved. So if you are interested, our entries are open until the 11th of October. You can email us at uctscrubrun at gmail.com to get involved. And we just like to thank everyone who has gotten on board already, who's keen and interested. Um, we're really excited to support the incredible work done at Red Cross and to ensure that pediatric patients are kept healthy and safe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alana. I'm handing over to Katie, who's been the amazing Zoom technician over the past few weeks, just to close us off. Thank you, and uh, thanks, Alana. I know I'm super excited for the big day. Um, and I just wanted to say a huge thank you, first of all, to Regan and Prof. Swime for hosting yet another excellent webinar. Um, and I'm sure the last two episodes of the series will be no exception. Um, and then, of course, I wanted to say thank you to our phenomenal speakers, to Prof. Regan for your really humbling and quite refreshing insights into um, leadership. And in particular, one thing you said really stood out for me, and that was about being leaders that do relevant and enabling work. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you to Dr. Reddy. Thank you for taking us into the somewhat less glamorous, but still critically important side of medicine, which is the financial side, um, and for introducing many of us to how we can become advocates as health professionals in the fiscal space. So thank you very much. And then lastly, to all our viewers, thank you so much for attending and engaging. We hope you enjoyed and please do attend episode seven next month where Dr. Urdit and Professor Ramafi King um, will be coming, or rather logging in, uh, to speak about post-operative care and the role of different health professionals in increasing access to quality surgery. So that's all for today, and thank you everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.